tried to go out the main gate, boom, they blew, the IRA blew up the back gate, screaming, take cover, take cover. All you could hear was the sound of our cocking mechanisms of our SA-80s. 19 years old, Northern Ireland, how hostile was it? I was patrolling the streets of Belfast, doing stuff that I'm probably not proud of. You're not going to hear this <laughs> story a lot, Dodge, you know, this is the story they don't want to tell. Well, where's life going to take me? Within six months, I was chronically addicted to crystal meth. I was a mentally unwell, damaged young man who yeah. just left the Marines. Did I want to be a triad? They took me in, mate. It got way deeper and way, way darker, right? And as I'm there, these two feet come over and I look up and it's the Daisu, the big brother. And he just looked down when he's cold, callous eyes. He's a thrower in the alleyway. Chris, welcome to the show, mate. How you doing, brother? Really good, really good. Let's roll all the way back. Where did you grow up and how did you end up becoming a Royal Marines Commando? I grew up in South East London, uh, but lived most of my life in the South West, or young life, we could say. I was homeless living in a Renault 12 at... Uh, Around a 12 estate. I should give that a plug, <laughs> shouldn't I? That's, that's a, the, the devil's in the detail. And um, yeah, I was in a car park sleeping in my car. My mate came up. His dad was a quote unquote war hero from the Falklands era. He led for um, Lima Company 4 2 Commando into battle. And he knocked on the window and went, Chris, I've just joined the Royal Marines. I've had to go on this three day course. It's like mega intense. They put us through the assault course, the endurance course, all these test exams. We had to fall backwards off the, off the high diving board. And I'm in the Royal Marines. He meant like he's got into training, yeah. right? And then he said, but of course you couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> the old dangly carrot. Yeah. <laughs> How old were you when you were sleeping in the car? I, I was 17. Okay. It was my second uh, time being homeless. Uh, first time was at 15 in my school uniform. It kind of gives you a clue as to my uh, challenges growing up, you could say. What was your upbringing like growing up? Um, beyond what I'd want to talk about here. Yeah. Uh, challenging dodge, you know, but it's all good. What a challenging mum and dad! Hey, yeah, my parents are beautiful people, but um, well, my, you know, my mum's no longer here, but they didn't have it together. They were that typical that generation where you get married young because yeah. it was the thing to do, and then you have the kids and you're not ready for them because you haven't overcome yeah. your own traumas. And uh, that comes down the generations, doesn't it? You know, and um, let's just say I went through some things that a toddler shouldn't have to go through. Yeah. And this continued, as you can tell, until I was 17, mm. sleeping in a car. Um, and when he said to me, you can't do that, I thought, yes, I can. Mm. So uh, I started reading the literature from the recruiting office. And I made myself a deal. We were at his place. It was, I think it was New Year's Eve. And we was all a bit pissed. I thought, right, now's my time. And where I lived, there was this famous rock. Anyone who knows where I live will, will know that rock on Dartmoor. And it was, a, it was half a mile away. I thought, right, if I can run around this rock and back without stopping, that was, that was the clincher, mm. without stopping. Then after the holiday, I'll go down to the recruiting office and I will apply to join the Royal Marines Commandos. And I was a drinker, I was a smoker. It wasn't pleasant. <laughs> Within a hundred meters, I thought, what the hell am I doing? Why, mm. why would they want me? Mm. You know, why would they want me? My family rejected me, school rejected me. Um, but Dodge, I knew. If I give up now, I'm going to give up for life, mm. you know? And that was a real big moment yeah. for me. And I, I just huffed it out, puffed it out. And I got back. I thought, right, let's do it. Let's do it. And uh, yeah, uh, 
as they say, the rest is history. Mm. I rocked up at, into training. Um, it, for, uh, for your listeners and viewers, the Royal Marines Commanders is generally said to be the toughest infantry level training in the world. And it was. Mm. <laughs> it really was. And um, here's the thing. Passing out and get and being awarded the green berry of the commando, that was quite special. Yeah. It was nothing compared to passing that three-day course to get into the Marines. That was my... So the three-day test, that teaser, was tougher than actually doing... Uh, it, it, Give me the give me an example of that three day. So you rock up at Limpson Commando. You're yeah. on a train. Half the people don't get off the train. You know the the, the potential recruits because yeah. they just get too scared. Yeah. Um, you go into. Uh, let's just say my mindset at the time it was the man's world. Yeah. That's not my mindset anymore. Mm. It's the children's. Mm, yeah. <laughs> it's the young people's <laughs> world. But. Yeah. Um, and that's it. And you, uh, you know, the Royal Marines will always be a very special part of my life, even though I've well, well moved moved on from that. Kind what of, year were we talking here when you went? Uh, that was 88. Okay. 88. And you get this big, burly drill instructor. In fact, no, we had an SBS guy, so yeah. special boat service, so yeah. special forces, big black corporal, like hard as nails. But there's a special thing in the Royal Marines that, for the most part, the guys are really good. You know, they're, they're nice guys. Mm. They, they just want you to succeed. They won't put up with dickheads and they won't put up with people that, you know, they don't want to see in combat, basically. Yeah. And uh, and this guy leads us into the camp and, uh, you know, I had nothing to go back to, Dodge, so it wasn't a problem for me. I'm like, right, let's go. You know, it was tough. It was one part, I was falling back on the endurance course. So the endurance course is... Two miles across Woodbury Common on Exmoor. Uh, it's a series of underground tunnels where literally it, it might be 100 metres long. Uh, this corrugated iron tunnel that's collapsing in from the, you know, from the, the, the yeah. woodland. So it's like potholing when you're going. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you crawl through, you've got, at some point, you've got an inch of water above your mouth. Yeah. Um, in training for real, you got to do it with all your weapon and equipment. Mm. But then we we were in what we called loose order, so just boots and, and camo gear. And uh, yeah, you got to pull yourself through it. And um, when we did it in training for real, it's February, so we had to break the ice on all this stuff. And you can't think about it, and you yeah. don't think about it. You're so committed, you want that green berry, you just want yeah. it, right? And and you don't think, you just plow straight on in. It's something called a sheep dip, which is like a eight, maybe ten foot long tube submerged underwater in February. <laughs> it's cold, <laughs> yeah. and you got to rely on your oppo, that's your buddy, to yeah. shove you into it, and your other buddy at the other end to drag, you know, grab anything, grab your hair, grab your equipment, yeah. and just drag you a out. A sheep of it. dip, this sheep is dip, as in the you know when they. Dip yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, when okay. they me medicate the sheep and, okay. they, and they push them underwater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, there was one point in that course I was starting to fall back. But I wouldn't stop yeah. because I had nothing to go back to, Dodge, yeah. you know. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. If I stop now, I'll stop for life. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Royal Marines Corporal, this big hard as nails guy, you know. Do you remember the his name? No. No, okay. <laughs> Corporal, probably. <laughs> Boss, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sir. You know, not yeah, mate. Yeah, just yeah, not yeah. at this stage. You don't yeah. call him mate, yeah. you know. And he dropped back and he put his arm around me. He went, do you know what, mate? In the Royal Marines, we ain't looking for supermen. We're looking for guys that don't give up just like you. Quality. And Stuck with you for life. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it took the military to tell me that. Yeah. Not, not. Mum not my family, school. not school. Da, 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 da. Just while you, just while you there, why were you rejected from school? What was your personality at school? What was your personality at home with your mum and dad? I was extrovert, so yeah. always looking for attention. Yeah, you know, if the ball went up the tree, I'll be the one that yeah. went up and got it. If the ball went on the on the weir in the river, <laughs> I'll be right yeah. shoes off. I'll get this. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was. 
that was my personality, but I was very damaged, Dodge, you know. Mm. It's taken me uh, a lot of years to realise that and, you know, come to grips with it. And years of substance abuse and and, and uh, associated mental health, which we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll come on to. But um, have, you dealt, have you dealt with the damage of being a kid now being 50 odd years old? Have you gone back and dealt with the trauma? Yeah, as much as you can. Yeah. The thing about trauma... You hear a lot about PTSD now and yeah. a lot of us joined up with it. You know, it wasn't something we got in conflict. In fact, I found conflict was quite exciting despite yeah. the fact that the guy behind me got shot three times and then the gunman turned his sights on me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, 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 that's what we joined up for. But you're an adult then. Yeah. You have adult mentality. You mm. can compartmentalize stuff. You can deal with it. You can seek help. Da 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 da. As a kid, you know, I don't know. Let's just use some random example. You get kicked. Do you swear on your podcast? Yeah, go for it. You get kick, you kicked yeah. a fuck. Yeah. Unconscious. How are you supposed to deal with that when you're three years old? Yeah. Right. You just think, oh, it's happened again. Yeah. Um. Um. It. it I must. I must be a bad person. Yeah. And, and, and deep down, you bury that yeah. memory, right? You don't have the ability as an adult to rationalize. You don't have the ability to go, well, I signed up for war and my mates yeah. got blown up. You know, tough shit. Yeah. You know, sorry, I'm not yeah, trying yeah, to be yeah, facetious. Yeah. I'm no, just I trying to you. say it how I it is, you. you know? And yet everyone feels sorry for the veteran who's got his legs blown off, yeah. even though he decided that that was his life joy. Yeah. What about that homeless person on the street yeah. drinking a, a frigging meth? Yeah. He's had it way worse. He's had it from childhood. He didn't sign up for it. He didn't ask for it. He doesn't know how to deal with it. And clearly from the fact that he's living homeless on the street, still hasn't come to terms with yeah. it, you know? Um, and I think as a society, we've, we, you know, we need to understand this mm -hmm. when, um, you know, we've got to look at our terminology. How old do you reckon you were when you realised this was going on? You're saying at three years old you took a beating. How old were you and you're like, you know what, I've got to do something about this. I need to get out. I need to escape. Um, oh, good question. Uh, I don't know, Dodge, okay. to be honest. All, all, all I can tell you now is as a city now, I'm an in, I would say I'm an enlightened individual. Yeah. Uh, my life's been a quest over 85 countries on all seven continents. Um you know, I'm a best-selling author. I've explored Antarctica. I'm a, I'm a qualified pilot, scuba diver, um, skydiver, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and all of this is, is, I guess, been in a quest. I didn't want second best. Yeah. I needed answers, you know. I needed answers. Um and it's led me to a beautiful place, mate, you know, yeah. a very beautiful place, a place of love, um, of which I'd say not many people really, Ag really achieve. Agree. Have you got forgiveness? Yes. You have? Yes, yeah. of, of course. So that's the powerful one, isn't yes, it? Yes, of forgive. course, yeah. of course. You've got to look at uh, people that may have harmed you and you've got to think, well, what was their life? Yeah. What did they go through? And then, then it makes you cry. Yeah. Because you realize, oh my God. Yeah. They did not have it good. And they weren't equipped with the tools to pass it on, to deal with this pain. Yeah. And it came out in this behavior or it came out in that behavior. And yeah, you can't be in a place of love without being in a place of 100%, mm. 100 percent forgiveness. How many years were you in the Royal Marines? Seven years. Seven years. And tell me your journey when you passed. Well, that feeling like you said, we went back a, back a page there, but you actually did the three days, which was really tough. Yeah. Then once you, what's that feeling like when they say, okay, you've got your green berry? Is it like a, a big show they on, go on stage or is it like, there's your berry? Well done, mate. Yeah, no, it's a big pass out parade. Okay. Uh, we had a drill instructor, Corporal Smith, bless him. He was such a good guy. What's his name? Corporal Smith. Smith, okay. I don't even know if he's still alive, but he mm. always rocked up to our drill instruction which you did kind of twice a week through. He's always hung over. He's like, <laughs> right, lads, just fin out down and Affy, have a, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll see you next. And, and, and we didn't do, we literally did hardly any drill until 
week 28 when we had our pass out uh, well week 32 yeah. we had our pass out yeah. with braid and about week 28 he went right i better do something now <laughs> with these guys and he trained us in this performance that was just if you ever seen a film officer and a gentleman mm -hmm. it was incredible mm -hmm. he made us look absolutely we marched on to the tune of thunderbirds and then we performed all this drill and in Quality. front of our parents that had all called us losers yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> it was beautiful but my best part was that three-day course okay. to get just to get into training and they called us in a room and they said and, and, and out of the 20 that started there's about six of us left two guys they call in they walk straight out they don't talk to you, you you're like oh they're the guys that have passed and yeah. they yeah we're all failures yeah. you know that that that's how life programs yeah. you two guys go in they come out they walk past you think all oh, right they've been told to probably come back in six months try again now you know you got what we got fella you you got what mm. we need fellas but you're not quite there yet you know and so we're there as the last two being expected to be told right you failed like don't you know <laughs> may as well just throw yourself don't get on the train yeah. just throw <laughs> yourself in front of it fella. and we got in that room and he said right and it was a color sergeant or something which is didn't mean much back mm -hmm. then but you know a fairly senior non-commissioned rank and he said right fellas pat yourself on the back you've just joined the royal marines and dodge i tell you yeah i can't believe i'm not crying now because mm -hmm. it's it's i have i still struggle with that moment you know it i was just made up i was the happiest mm -hmm. person on the planet it was I'm a Royal, I'm a Royal Marine, yeah. you know, I might not be a Royal Marines commando yet, but I'm, I've, I've done what they all told me that I couldn't do. And I've done it out the back of a Renault 12. Yeah. Happy <laughs> so. days, mate. Tell me what the difference is to a Royal Marine and a Royal Marine commando. So Royal Marines can be a band member, someone who plays an instrument in the band. Yep. It can be a cadet, yep. someone who's, you know, a, a junior, um, in, I believe back in history you actually had Royal Marines and then you had to apply to become a commando. But in, in modern day parlance, basically you join up, you're a Royal Marines recruit. We call it nod because you're always falling asleep in your yeah. lectures. You're always nodding off. Mm -hmm. And you do your 30 weeks training as a Royal Marine recruit. And then if you pass all five commando tests, um, which includes a, a swimming test, you get presented with a green berry and your commando flashes and at that point you become a, a Royal Marines commando. Quality. And how long was it when you become a Royal Marines commando when you went on your first tour? Well, they ask you in training what unit you want to go to. So you've got basically four or five commando, uh, 40 commando or four two. And I knew four two were going straight into conflict in, the, uh, in Northern Ireland. And I thought, I want to get straight there, you know. This is, it's almost like almost part of the, the whole indoctrination process of being in the military. You're trained to kill. That's, you know, you're trained to serve your country or that's what you, you believe yeah. when, when, when you're 18 years old. So at 19, uh, I was patrolling the streets of Belfast with a, what essentially is a machine gun, fully automatic rifle patrolling down the white lines in the, in the middle of a a, a a main road all the traffic stops for you because they are not they know don't mess mm. stopping ira soldiers in the street searching them doing stuff that i'm probably not proud of if i if i was honest um you're 19, you're a child. Yeah, a child, yeah. Our society failed yeah. that children are given fully automatic weapons yeah. and they can stop a guy twice your age, three times your age and treat them. It's, you're not going to hear this yeah. <laughs> story a lot, Dodge, you know. Yeah. This is the story they don't want to tell. Um, we were on patrol one day. We tried to go out the main gate. Boom, They blew the IRA blew up the back gate. I was like, take cover. What's going on? What's going on? The oh, oh, commander, let's call him Smudges on the radio. He's like, right, 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 back in, back in. So we ran back into the camp. 
Four hours later, after a debrief, we went out back out on patrol and we uh, patrolled up to an ar- area called the Ardoyne, which is a hardened Republican, you know, air, air, area, not, not, not a Protestant area, obviously. And, um, they detached was a Conco, which is a continuity officer. That's the a chap from the unit before you that stays behind to show the new guys the ropes and the territory and where things are going to go bang and you know where you're going to get sniped at and this kind of stuff. And he turned around. He said, um, "And it, we're, we're only you know we were there about two weeks at this stage." He said, "Right, fellas, break into diamond formation. We'll go across the park because this alleyway is renowned for IEDs." So we broke into Diamond, just as, as with our training. Nothing at this point had happened. So we were we weren't lackadaisical, but we were getting there. You know, it was like, is anything ever gonna like happen in this city, or is this all just like hyped up bullshit? Yeah. You know. And as soon as I stepped foot on that grass, and I got about ten paces, suddenly, bang, 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 boo, 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 and all you could hear was the sound of our cocking mechanisms of our SA-80s slamming off the walls and, and reverbing back and smudge sh- screaming, take cover, take in cover. And we legged it and I'm looking down and the ground is just pinging up by my feet like little greeny brown geezers coming off the ground like in the, in, the, in the bloody films yeah. you watched as yeah. a kid, right? <laughs> And we got behind this building and just like sort of, you know, collapsed. And I turn around trying to locate the firing point. So we're all made ready at this point. It's the, the job is on, right? And I'm looking for the sniper, gunman. And as I'm looking for the firing point, our buddy Jock is sparked out on the grass, like face down. And my first thought was, is he just like taking cover by hitting the, is this some kind of, because he'd been there three times before. This is his third tour of yeah. Northern Ireland. I thought maybe the geezer knows something we don't just to hit the ground. And I thought, and then I looked and his equipment was spread all around him. His rifle was five meters this way. His electronic equipment was two meters that. I thought he's been hit. He's been hit. I was first aided, I so I immediately just started running back. That's why you do a 200 meter fireman's carry in training is for this yeah. exact scenario, grab your buddy, get him into cover. And I'm running, the team's going, Chris, get down. You know, and I'm like, I can't do that. Mm. And as I started running back, Jock pops his head up and he had like eyes as big as saucers, man. This guy was just in shock. Mm. And in that second, he leapt to his rifle, grabbed it, he leapt to the electronic equipment, and he'd just come running over to where we were, and he collapses. He's I'm hit, I'm hit, I'm hit. I'm ripping open his his Paris mock, that's his uh, yeah. combat jacket. I'm ripping open his Niebuhr jacket, that's your, 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 your flat jacket with a bulletproof yeah. plate on it. I'm like, Jock, you're not here. You're not fucking here. And he's like, I'm hit, I'm hit, I'm hit. Meanwhile, Smudge is on the radio. Zero, this is uh, patrol, you know, November 5, zero alpha, contact, we have casualties, over. And Jock's shouting, I'm not hit, I'm not hit, I'm not hit. And, and Smudge is, uh, zero, November 5, zero, bravo, uh, we don't have casualties, over. And I'm ripping, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm like, he's, you're not hit, you're not hit. I can't find any in holes, mate. He's like, I'm hit, I'm hit, I'm hit. <laughs> and it it was just hyper confusing in that moment. I I'm checking him out. I can't find any holes. Can't certainly can't put a you know a, a field dressing mm. on anything. And um, turns out, Dodge, the first round from this gunman had gone through his sling on his weapon on the SE80. There's a you know nylon sling. Then there was the hole. Yeah. Second round had taken the antenna off his electrical equipment. Third round had smacked him right in the chest. Hadn't even hit the fiberglass plate that's designed to stop your heart getting hit. It had just gone just above it. Funnily enough, when, when he got back to camp, they found the round 7.62 short, mm. okay, which doesn't carry the velocity mm. of a uh, what's called a long round. They found it in his combat jacket pocket. <laughs> right, right. And um, 
you know, all credit to Jock, he would not get in that ambulance, mm. you know, despite being in mm. severe shock, despite being hit three times. Mm. He's like, no, nah, Royal Marines don't get in ambulances. <laughs> and, he, and we patrol back in. Um, and of course, he was the guy behind me on a patrol. So the first three rounds hit him. Mm. The next seven rounds were aimed at me yeah. <laughs> because I started running. Mm. It, it's, you know, the, the, you know, and you zigzag when you run. You don't run in a straight line, yeah. obviously. Yeah. You know, they're pinging either side of me. So, yeah, big experience. Um, it wasn't the only contact we had, but I won't bore, bore you with a rest. What was the, was, what was the how do you know who the RA was and who they who wasn't? Uh, intelligence. Okay. Oh, let's be honest. Even... Even back then, you have informants, don't you? Mm. And they're going to tell the police or the security service mm. everything that they, in order to stop themselves going to yeah. prison, probably they're going to inform on everyone. So you know, you know everyone. You have pictures of them. I had this weird, uncanny um, ability to be in the briefing room, of which all the pictures are spread out around the briefing room, and I would look at them and I, I would photo memorize them. So we could be on patrol and a car, a Sierra would drive by a hundred meters away mm. and I'd be like, smudge that one. Yeah. And we'd step out and stop it. Yeah. And every single time it would be, um, you know, we call them players. Mm. Some people call them the, uh, the T word. I'm not going to say that on your podcast. I don't, to me, they What's were the T word. Uh, things that make people go, <laughs> people that make things go bang. <laughs> right. Um, to me, they were soldiers, mm. you know, or certainly are to me at this age. You know, they were fighting. What's the T word? Terrorist. Ter okay. You know, they're fighting their cause, aren't they? We was fighting ours. Yep. Was we both brainwashed and naive? But they've got religion, haven't they, that's yeah. telling them da 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 da. They've got, I think we should all just get along, Dodge, yeah. you know? Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. we should all just get along. 19 years old, Northern Ireland. Mm. How hostile was it? Were people hostile towards you everywhere you went? Were you boys hostile towards the locals? What was it like? Yes. So we 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 arrived. You fly into the um, the airport. Can't even remember the name of it now. Someone will put it in your comment section, and you get into uh, pigs. Pigs is arm uh, armored personnel carrier. Yeah. And I was at the back, so I had the luxury of looking out the little slot. Okay. It's like six inches yeah. by three inches or four inches. And I had it pushed open and I'm looking because I'm, it's like I'm on holiday, right? Yeah. This is, this is all new. <laughs> I'm like 19 yeah. at this stage. This is all new to mm. me. Um, I don't, we, I don't, we hadn't even been issued our weapons at this stage. So if anything had happened, um, yeah, that would have been interesting. And I'm looking out the back and as we got into the city, we drove past a pub and everybody outside that pub, don't ask me what they're doing outside a mm. pub because you could smoke in pubs back mm. then, but there was mm. a, a, a gaggle outside. And as soon as they saw us, they went into like panic mode. How quickly can I pick up a brick yeah. or a chair or a, or an ashtray mm. Or, and and throw it at this at the enemy. Yeah. The, the, these are civilians. I mean, they could have been IRA soldiers amongst them, and mm. no doubt were. And they just come out and they're throwing stuff at us. And I just turned around to the guys and went, "Guys, you 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 need to see this." <laughs> it was like, "Oh my god!" Just never seen anything yeah. like it, Dodge. Yeah, 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 sure. These guys want to, uh, yeah. They want to end our life, you know. Um, How were you feeling at that time? You grew up with a lot of trauma. Mm. You carried that trauma on. You passed at 17. You've got relief. You're kind of like free now. You feel like a man. You've got a machine gun in your hand. There's a 19 year old kid, really 19, is still young. And you're in someone else's country walking on their turf and they don't like you. Um, well, First off, I didn't realise I had trauma through until I went through the the addiction mill. Okay, and it spat me out the other yeah. side, and or it or it it hammered me down enough to make me go, oh, I'm a bit damaged, aren't I? Okay. I need to make some changes in my life, yeah. right? Um, back then, 
It's a massive ego, isn't it? That's how they get you, the, the powers that be, powers that be, these satanic elitists, they get you, they keep you in your ego. They're very good at it. They call it the, In spiritual terms, they call it your lower self, yeah. that you are an actually an identity as opposed to being the universe experience itself subjectively. Mm. So at 19, you don't know all this shit. Yeah. You just think like, oh, you know. I'm and a, back I'm, then, there was no internet to check it all out or social yeah, media. Exactly. There was nothing there, was there? You're kind it, of like... Put in a box, that's what you're doing, away you go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. Exactly. How many years were you a Royal Commando? And what years? Uh, I joined in 88. I left in 95. Okay. And that's interesting in itself for anyone listening. And I'll tell you why. The, the average service of a Royal Marine is between seven and nine years. The reason behind that, some would say, is... We joined up with a certain mindset that we wanted to further ourselves. We wanted a, a challenge. We wanted experience and we wanted adventure. Mm. And when after seven years, you've, you've kind of done it all. So I'd been in conflict. I've been in the Northern Ireland conflict. I conducted Arctic warfare training up in Norway, which just an unbelievable experience. And I was lucky I was on a ship for a year. So I was on a elite, uh, not elite, a uh, uh, high security detachment protecting certain uh, weapon systems, can we say, on board a, an aircraft carrier. And we sailed around the world for 14 months. It was unbelievable. Bad. You know, I was paid to sail to Barbados. And when I got there, Sun, sea, and sex is just, uh, it was just brilliant. Mm. I mean, I'm 22 years old, mm. for Christ's sake. It was just un, unreal, unreal. Um, but here's the thing. You start to get to a point where you think, well, I've done all this now. What, what else has life got in store? And if I'm to stay for the full, it was 22 years back then. To get your pension, isn't it? 22? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Am I doing that because it's really going to develop me as a person or am I doing it because I'm a bit scared to, we call it going outside. Yeah. And I start to see this phenomenon. And I'm not criticizing people now that absolutely love their military career and wanted, to, that. that's great. Yeah. But for a lot of us, it wasn't like that. We, we kind of looked around and we thought, well, this guy's a bit of a dick mm. and he's too scared to leave. And that guy over there, is, and, 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 and they had this thing, they'd say, there's nothing outside. I thought, well, it clearly is because, like most people, are not in the Royal Marines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I've lived now, like I say, lived, worked, and travelled in eighty-five countries across all seven continents. It's been a special thing for me. Yeah, in my learning, in my growth. In Were my you done? Were you like, I'm done after my seven years now? Get me out. I want to. I want to go and get a mortgage. I want to go travelling. I want to see what else is out in the world. No, I wasn't done. What happened was, I was in that trap. Of like, I, I ended up doing four years at the end of my career. I was just basically doing guard duty. I got promoted very early to corporal, mm. uh, which is lance corporal, but you don't say that in the Marine. It's, it's just corporal. Mm. And I'm on for a junior command course. So I'm going to be an actual full corporal mm. quite young. I mean, I'm like 22 or something. Mm. And I'm always looking for the new experience. Because I'm suffering trauma. Yeah. I need answers. You know, I don't know that at the time. I just think I'm just living my life like anyone else does, you know. And what happened was I started to, um, I got invited to look at a network marketing company, a company called Amway. While you're still in the Marines. Yeah, whilst I'm still okay. in the Marines. And yeah. I went for this meeting, this uh, business presentation meeting. And I thought, oh my God, this is just a lot of brainwashed yeah. people. They're never going to make it in bit, You know, they did, They can't think for themselves. And I, I could see it. And the same guy that invited me, a chap called Ralph, still a good friend of mine to this day, went, Chris, you didn't like that, but I've got a new one for you. It's called Corum International. It's consumer electronic products. They're storming the market. They're taking over this network, that network. So I got involved. I thought I can sell personal attack alarms, especially in the nineties where yeah. crime was the like the big yeah. the big thing, you know, breaking into cars, yeah. women getting it. Yeah. And within a uh, two weeks of signing up for that company, I'd sold two hundred of these alarms. Mm. All, all to me, my fellow Marines, <laughs> bless them. Yeah. And I'd been promoted to something called Silver Executive. So I had the first four levels 
of what they called a compensation plan that meant that I'd sold all this merchandise and I'd got people involved. I had a guy in the Netherlands, da 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 da, da mm. and then boom, I hit a guy in Hong Kong, a chap called, uh, he's called Vince Lee in my book. He's uh, Eating Smoke, folks. <laughs> Is the name of your book? Eating Smoke. Eating Smoke. That's my, yeah. Yeah, I've done three memoirs now, but yeah. that was the first one. And uh, I called up this guy in Hong Kong. I said, uh, Vince, uh, it's Chris. I'm a, a friend of Flash in the Marines in in England. Ah, Flash, yeah, yeah, yeah. good guy, good guy. Uh, Vince, you were involved in network marketing. This guy was a gold distributor in Amway, so he really had yeah. like risen above the the average few that really don't make any money. And he had a huge network in Hong Kong. He went, yeah, Chris, uh, just uh, give me your distributor number. I start right away, <laughs> right? I do the voice because I wrote a book about yeah, it, and, yeah, yeah. and and it's just I'm not trying to be patronising, yeah. dodge, you know. No, no, it's, I hear it's you. in my brain. Yeah, yeah, Chris, I I start right away. That was it. All I did, I given this little you know, ten-digit number. Next week, I'm the biggest distributor in the Asia Pacific for Quorum International. Literally. What? So you 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 left Marines and went and no, worked no, no. in Hong Kong. No, no, no. I'm still in the Marines, okay. right? You got to put eighteen months' notice in to get out. And suddenly, this guy's fired off. Within a month, he'd he'd signed up hundreds of distributors he had people in mainland china when they didn't even have network marketing there yeah you know we, we were the first company there i'm going to meetings in the uk and they're like this is chris he's um he's a silver executive and he's just on for the next diamond position in the company that that's the yeah. big you know it is for our friends listening, it's all bullshit, right? None of that's going to make you happy, right? Yeah. None of it's going to make. But back back then, for a damaged young cookie, yeah. it was it so was important. Yeah, of course, I'm I'm going to be a millionaire. Yeah, I'm going to get that Porsche. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this time next year, Rodders. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I put my notice in immediately. My check that month, Dodge, mm. was. Remember, we're talking thirty years yeah. ago now. It was it was two thousand five hundred and sixty eight mm. quid or something. Mm. Plus, I'm getting a gram from the Marines yeah. monthly. I'm on. Fair I mean, even that so. now probably isn't too bad a wage, yeah. but but back then it was. So I went off to Hong Kong. I'm on the train. I'd rented my house out to some floozy and I just knew it was all going to go wrong. She was going to trash the place. And it was, you know, I was going to end up with a big bill and I was going to be on the other side of the world. And I'm on the train leaving Plymouth and I'm smoking a spliff out the window of the train. I'm like, Chris, you know this is all going to go wrong, don't you? Yeah, uh, yeah, and I knew it, Dodge. I knew it. <laughs> At that moment, had another option been there, like I would have glad, but sometimes you just got to ride life, haven't you, and see where it takes you, you know? Got out to Hong Kong, went into the company headquarters, this big palatial palace in um, Causeway Bay in Hong Kong, which is like a moving and shaking place. I walked in and, and I, I saw Winston Wong. He was the... the, the uh, Winston, opera, Winston Wong. Winston Wong, yeah. Every Chinese has a Chinese name and yeah. then they have their English name, yeah. right? I'm um, so Winston, what's going on? Uh, That's a cracker of a name, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, Winston, what's going on? You know, 18 months ago, I'm turning over £100,000 a month. I'm the big cheese. Uh, last month, we turned over like $5,000. Oh, Chrisa. Uh what it is is your distributor are not working hard enough. I'm like, oh you fucking dickhead. And I just literally pirouetted and walked out the door and dodge I knew it was over. Yeah. No, like, ooh, come try yeah. and make no, it it was oh and I walked out that door and I thought, Well, where's life gonna take me? And it and it took me on a funny journey. Within six months, I was chronically addicted to crystal meth. So you stayed out in Hong Kong? Yeah, I, was, I, I wasn't going to come back. For a start, I loved Hong Kong. And when was the first time you tried crystal meth? Out there? Uh, or- out there, yeah. Yeah, I was in a, working in this crazy computer company. We were supposed to be selling DRAM chips, which is a computer memory. They they trade like gold on the, on the exchange, you know. Mm. I didn't sell a... 
single freaking thing in seven months of being there. <laughs> I, I'm all I'm employed for employed for is my white face. Yeah. So this crazy old Chinese boss in his psychology, it's like if I've got lots of white people Keep in the office, of, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's going to look great when yeah. my and customers would fly in from Thailand, Taiwan. Mm. They they'd have like um, hoods, probably dressed a bit like me mm. now, but you know carrying briefcases with a million dollars in, yeah. uh, or going out on the air. They call it hand carrying, where you take hand luggage, and in your hand luggage is a million Hong Kong dollars, a hundred thousand pound, mm. basically of DRAM chips. Right? It was it was a it was, you know, it was. It wasn't. It wasn't quite gangster, yeah. but but it was. It sounds naughty, doesn't uh, it? It was course. naughty. Yeah. yeah, it was naughty. Yeah, and, um, and if they got away with it, good luck to them. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And if they got a hit, probably like all the big dealers in the world, yeah. they can soak it up, yeah. right? So anyway, I'm in. The, I'm, I haven't sold nothing in that company. I'm cracking on with this London geezer Gary Knight, who's still my mate to this day. He's just so funny, so funny. He, t- he told me this story once about how we. Him and his mates robbed the coal yard because they were so poor. So he used to fill up his school bag with coal, right? Come back, right? Cops knock on the door one day and they're like, and his dad's like, yeah, what do you want? He's like, we want to talk to your son. He's like, yeah, why? Uh, We think he's been robbing coal from the coal. And, And Gary says... There's a fucking fire raging in the background, and my dad's like, <laughs> my dad's like trying to cover it. Co- cover, co- just, I just met some amazing people. When was the there, first you know? time you tried crystal so, meth? So, so I'm in this company, bored out my skull. Yeah, we used to have coffee drinking competitions. Oh, you can drink the most coffee. We used to send out letters to clients, dear shit far and. F- up your ass. Uh, you don't know her. Yeah, it, it was just a variation on the company newsletter yeah. and we would just bastardize yeah. it to make it just this obscene thing. Anyway, I went to take a leak. The, the floor the floor below was the toilet and I'm in the toilet. I've, I'm having a leak and I'm, what's that funny smell? It's like this pungent but, but sort of perfumey smell. Mm. And as I'm taking a leak, the, the cubicle opens and it's my schizophrenic work buddy uh tom jones right sorry his real name was tom jones in my book he's neil diamond mm. right i tried to get the, a bit of a <laughs> parallel there right i probably failed but and uh he's like chris come in here i thought oh i'm either gonna get drugs or i'm gonna get sex <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking about the sex. But anyway, I, I went in the cubicle and he had this silver foil and it's like, oh God, that's really bad boy. Yeah, I'm up for this. I've heard about this ice stuff, crystal meth. Yeah. Apparently it sends you mental. Got to have a bit of that, you know. And he just, he gave, he shoved this rolled up Hong Kong note in my mouth and I just, I hoovered up one line. No, 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 you know, I just thought, yeah, yeah. Um, be, be a bit careful. I went back to my desk and within about 30 seconds, I've got to be careful what I say here because you can't talk about the effects of uh, this such things on, on, on the video platforms that we're on. But let's just say... You say, know, how it, say how it is. Well, like drinking the finest champagne, but without any of the cloggy, like, I'm pissed, you know. Mm. Dodge, I thought I'd come home. I thought... It was the key in the lock for me. It was, this is what I've been missing my whole life. I feel normal now, you know. It's buried all that trauma. I didn't know this. Yeah. I'm telling you in hindsight mm. that obviously it was like burying the trauma. I'm not nervous. I'm not, you know, da, da, da. Oh, my God. As soon as that clock struck seven, because we work 12-hour days, I'm like <laughs> straight over to Chunky Mansions, which is a, the, the ghetto in Hong Kong where a lot of the um, emigre community live. And of course, they survive by selling certain things. My mate was gone, gone A and Mark. And Mark is that oh, the triads? No. 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 This is uh, the triads hang around there. If you want to, you know, fake Rolex or mm. or Gucci's or, mm. you know, Ray-Ban or whatever, they, they, you, you can go and have a chat. First time I did, I knocked up a try and I went, oh, can I get some weed? He's like, yeah, come with me. Right? Honestly, it's like a scene from a um, uh, John Con Van Damme film. Mm. You go into a dungeon and there's this guy with his shock of purple hair and all, you know, all, all his henchmen stood around the room and he's p- 
pulls this drawer open. There was this pillow-sized bag of weed. Mm. And he's like, how much do you want? I went, um, just enough for a couple of spits. <laughs> 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 just right. give me an eighth please mate yeah. <laughs> and he just was like he looked at me and he just took a little pinch out and and anyway so so I went over to see Mark he didn't have that but he, he actually had um, H will not say the word but yeah. everyone knows what I'm yeah. talking about I thought, dangerous and there's two school kids in his in his flat I say kid I mean they're like you know 17 yeah. they're at high school yeah. the Hong Kong high school and they was well into all, and I'm like, guys, do you, you know, do you do this? And they're like, no, no, we just smoke weed these days. Go, we we're over that, <laughs> right? I'm like, is it is it like any good? I mean, well, it'll give you this kind of buzz. It all. Yeah. I'm like, right, okay, hit me up with it. And I, and I went back, and it, 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 you know, it was nothing compared to this crystal stuff, right? So did you go and try H? Yeah, 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 you yeah. Did yeah, yeah. Okay. Did it? Did it? Did it quite. Not a lot, but compared yeah. to people that live a normal life, yeah. you know, we used to go. Um, what was that feeling like that compared one, to crystal meth? Uh, mongy. Okay. You know, mongy, uh, you feel very sick when you're not used to it. You know, you're going to go and urge in the toilet. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you, my eyes used to go bright white and you pinprick pupils and, 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 you know, I went out on a couple of stuff. It, it, it's, it was never my thing. The only time it ever came into good was after we'd been dancing all night and high as hell mm. on, on meth. We'd go back to a flat and it, we used to go to the homeless population in um, it back of Wan Chai, Causeway Bay in Hong Kong. And I developed, you know, I'd walk up, the homeless guy would see me, I'd wink. Literally, that's all you do. He knows what you want. I'll get me map, me street map out like I'm some stupid tourist. I go, yeah, GM guy, one, one straw. And they had it in drinking straws with the ends sealed. Yeah, GM guy, they give it to you. You whack it in your mouth so you can swallow it if, if you get that come, busted. Yeah. Yeah. You, you palm him, you know, 100 bucks or whatever, 10 quid, and there you go. We used to do that on a on a come down. And, oh my god! I don't, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to describe it because I don't want anyone doing it. No, you know? no, no. But, I want to know. I want to know what that come down's like. Well, it's, this is, we're talking crystal meth here, aren't we? Yeah, but yeah. it's better. I tell you about the meth experience. Yeah, it's it taught me so much, Dodge. You know, what does it do? Is it like ecstasy? It's, is it, okay, what's it right. a mixture of what? Like, what, how would you explain crystal meth? What does it look it's, like, straight, first of all? Right. So, first of all, it's called crystal meth because it's a crystal. little crystal rock. Yes. Yep. Think of it like rock salt. Yep. You know, that. Yep. The reason it's crystal is it's purified amphetamine. Pure. Not the stuff you buy in a nightclub it's where it's up. got, you know, yep. glucose yep. and it's probably like about 3%. So, crystal pure. meth is purified speed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Pure methamphetamine. So, yep. the strongest form of amphetamine. You then put it through this chemical process and it and it takes out all the impurities and it just leaves you with amphetamine. Right. 98.7% wow, wow. pure. And right? what are you doing? You buy in on weight, you buy in a gram, half a gram, 0. 0.2. I started off uh, buying about a tenth of a gram. Yeah. 10% 10, 10 of a yeah. uh, And I would kind of do that in a night right and i go to work the next day not having slept i'd still be sort of high a bit happy. in the end um it, it, it it's very difficult you can't think of it in terms of say coke mm. where a gram of coke you can do that in what in like mm. uh, four minutes with mm. you if you've got a buddy mm. with you and then you want some more don't you no it's, it's nothing like that you know, a couple of them little crystals, they don't, you, you're, you're on it. Right. You are like, whoa, and right. you still got this whole gram. Right. And that, that gram would last me best part of a week, you know. Mm. I mean, I, I, I did know guys apparently that would inject that in like two sessions, yeah. right? But I was never at that stage and I couldn't have been at that stage because I developed psychosis. Mm. Um, so I started to take it more and more. 
I got fired from this job uh, for speaking Cantonese to the to the boss who didn't like it because if you can speak Cantonese as a guaylo, guaylo means foreign devil, mm. you know, f- uh, sorry, ghost ghost man, yeah. so a foreigner, yeah. like he's worried you're stealing his business. So I got sparked from that job. Cut. Long story sh- short, after being DJ at the biggest nightclub in southern China, which also went wrong, but nothing to do with what we we said. <laughs> I'm back in Hong Kong. I'm homeless. I'm you're back in Hong Kong. Yeah, you're homeless. In Hong Kong. I've come back from China. I'm homeless. I've been on this meth journey now about six months. I'm sat on my backpack on the Nathan Road, watching all these BMWs, Mercedes. Rolls Royce. Hong Kong's got the most Rolls, Roy- Rolls Royces in the world, you know. I'm thinking, guys, come on, just somebody stop and go, all right, fella, you look like you're down on your lap. Come and have a job in my company. We'll, mm. we'll. Would it have sorted me out? No, of course no. it wouldn't because I had this big addiction. devil in my yeah, life yeah. Uh, called addiction. Did you, did you find that you were getting addicted? You were like, I like that hit. That first hit you had in your office, did you find, I want a piece of this? Were you thinking about it every day? Ah, immediately. Okay. Yeah. I couldn't get home, Dodge. Yeah. I went from that office. I had to go across the Harbour Tunnel. So from Hong Kong Island to Kowloon, which is the mainland no, 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 where Kowloon, I lived. Yeah. I lived in Mong Kok, which is the most crowded square kilometre on the planet. Unbelievably crowded, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was there I, a couple of years ago. for the. I went to the Rugby World Cup in Japan and we stopped in Hong Kong for a couple of days. That is so crowded and so expensive. Jeez. Yes. Yeah. And I'm getting to Chim Sa Choi which is the the pinnacle of the Kowloon Peninsula where Chunky Mansion is. And I'm stood there on the platform going, should I, shouldn't I? Chris, why are you even having this com- conversation? You know what you're going to do. Mm. Boom, straight to Chunky Mansion, straight to see Mark. Mate, score. what you got, what yeah. you got, you know. How old were you at this time, roughly? I was... Uh, 26, 25? I was 20, 25 okay. by this, by this mm. time. And... Um, it ended up with me uh, selling my Rolex, my first Rolex. This is my replacement, and it's literally like a stupid trinket on my wrist. Mm. I just wear it for podcasts mm. as, a, as a talisman. <laughs> but my first Rolex. Is it snide? Is it real? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, it's that's real. real. That's um, Rolex Sea Dweller. Okay. Probably, I don't know, £7,000 mm. if you wanted to buy buy that. And I, But I bought one after... I think the Northern Ireland conflict or, or it might have been my Norway service. And it was very special. I love that. What, you know, mm. the Swiss engineering and it's been Tell down. me about this crystal meth journey. Well, well, when did the crystal meth stop? Well, I'm going to tell yeah. you about it. So I hocked my Rolex in this. That's how desperate I was. You give me a grand for it. I only paid 1300 quid. Mm. And remember, this is 30 years yeah. ago. Was, and uh, with that money, I got a flat. It was this old antiquated flat on top of a, a, a tenement building in one the back of one chai we're talking like bruce lee gangster film yeah you know it, it was deep dark and wonderful mate you know <laughs> and i'm living on the top floor in this barren flat just sleeping on the concrete i built myself a bamboo bunk bed and i thought right i need a you know i need a job i need a job and i wandered into a nightclub uh, in my book, it's called uh, Nemo, right? It's actually called Neptunes, but mm. any Hong Kong person listening knows what I'm talking about. And I wandered in looking for my mate uh, who, who who worked there, Glenn. I was going to say, Glenn, get us a job, mate. Where you know, where's where's hiring? I'm, and he went there, and I said, went up to the bar. He says, "Where's Glenn?" And, uh, and a Chinese guy went. He just nods at, at, at this guy in a dark suit, black tie, like Reservoir Dogs kind mm. of shit, you know, but Chinese guy. And I went over and immediately I'm looking at him. He's got one eye, he's looking northwest, and the other eye's, n- the other eye's not. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, okay. I said, oh, Glenn. He said, oh, Glenn gone Thailand. Uh, you want a job? You can do a doorman job? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah I can. You know, I'd, I'd bounced in two clubs yeah. by this time. Mm-hmm. He said, okay, start here tomorrow night, eight o'clock. Fuck me, I'm back in a job. I can pay my bill. Yeah. You know? So I started in this club and on the first night, I'm, I'm you, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be a doorman, mm. you, you, just like you would in the UK, yeah. you know, do your job, yeah. you know, you're there to stop trouble. Mm. Da, da, da. And this guy at the bar is a Westerner, expat. He says, uh, you're Chris, aren't you? So immediately I'm like, how the 
Mm. How do you know? My, you know, but they, yeah. they, he said, um, you know, they're all triads, don't you? My ears pricked up, Dodger. I'm like a dog here yeah. in walkies. Mm. It's like I've come from a club, the Royal Marines, yeah. you know, a boys' club. I'm in a boys' club that, let's be honest, when you grow up with Bruce Lee films yeah. and all that stuff, I was training in the gym over there, all these triads with these big muscles and these dragon tattoos. Yeah. You can't help at 25 years old to be a bit taken in by it yeah. all, you know? I'm like, okay. He says, yeah, your man there, yeah, your, your fellow doorman, that's Chu Chai. He's like this little guy. He says, he's a street fighter. He'll pick up anything in a scrap if he thinks he can do an enemy's, you know, head in with it. Okay. He says, and your, your, your man there, Daisu, he's a six foot two geezer, like tall for yeah. a Chinese, looked like a horse, you know. Yeah. He's <laughs> looked like a horse. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's assassin. Yeah. They call it a uh, violent hand in, in Cantonese, yeah. you know. Um, Every now and again, he said, you'll see him disappear. It's when they smuggle him across the border into China to, to do a hit on someone. Uh, and then they smuggle him back again. So I'm like, okay, this, this sounds like fun, right? And did the first night there in the morning. They took me for breakfast with the family. Right, Dodge, I was never a triad. I've never claimed to be. Yeah. That's not my story. Yeah. I was a mentally unwell, damaged young man who yeah. just left the Marines and, and just at a challenge, you know, that's almost, yeah. was never, did I want to be a triad? It, they took me in, mate, okay. you, you know, they looked after me. They mm. took me for breakfast the first morning, but the problem was the night before, this tiger had been sent over from another club called a Pussycat Club to be with a manager, yeah. to like, you know, mm. escort them. And I, I didn't know about all that stuff yeah. then. I was like naive, you mm. know, there's these two Thai girls and they're with the owner of the club, He's not triad, he's just businessman, yeah. but you've got to pay the triads to run your club. Yep. And it's probably the same in the UK, Soho. Yeah. It's definitely the same in Thailand. Mm. You, you, it, this is not like new news, yeah. you know. Anyway, one of the girls that was with my uh, Dilo, they're called Big Brother, right? He's the gang leader, right? He's called David. I call him something different in my book. Um, she gets up to go to the bar and as she walked across, boom, she just collapses. Bang. Well, I'm the doorman, aren't I? This is my job now. And I'm ex-Marine, so I'm first aid trained. Mm. Da, 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 da. And I walked over and uh, this girl's gone blue. And a friend is jumping up and down on her. And at first I thought they was like mucking around, showing mm. off to their important dates. You know, this my my boss, the Dilo, is the most important man in Wan Chai. Yeah. You know, you don't mess with this guy, you know. And I'm like, I get down, she's blue. I push her mate off. I'm like, what's she taken? And a look in her eye told me, you don't talk about that here. Yeah. You know, drugs in Cantonese oh, culture oh, is God. like you don't yeah. mention it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You only do substances when you've made your golden fortune. Mm. Then you can do what you want. Mm. If you do them as a lay person, you're a loser, mm. right? And and it's deep and dark, Dodge. And it got yeah. deep, it got way deeper and way, way, way darker, right? And so I push her off and I'm I'm I I put my mouth over her mouth because I couldn't sense any breathing. And there's like just a tiny breath I can feel like on my tongue, you know. And I took her pulse. It's something like 160. So I'm thinking this has got to be ice yeah. oh, 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 overdose. And I'm like, right, someone give me a blanket. And this Daisu, this big like assassin geezer come over. And I'm like, Daisu, blanket. He was like, and you could see the confusion, like, in their eyes. They just want this problem dealt with. Yeah. They hate this superstitious, this old, you know. And as I'm there, these two feet come over, and I look up, and it's the Daisu, the big brother, David. And he just looked down with his cold, callous eyes. He says, throw her in the alleyway. I'm like, I, I, I couldn't understand Dodge. Mm. You know, I, di I didn't get it then, you know, I didn't get the whole triad culture, yeah. the fate, the issue of face, respect. You don't want a Thai prostitute, mm. hate to use the word yeah. prostitute, yeah, but yeah. you know, a working girl collapsing in your club on drugs in a culture that, well, empty, that is yeah. like the lowest of the yeah. low in a boy gang that hates that kind of stuff, you, you know, yeah. well, you know, problem. And so I just ignored him. 
And I'm like, Daisu, get me a blanket. And he's, and he's like panicked because his boss has said, throw her out. And he's got to go. At, and he come back with this dirty rag from the cleaning room, you know. Mm. And I'm like, I put it. This Westerner come over. He's the only expat in the club at that point. All, all, all of them were Chinese. He went, you all right, mate? I said, uh, go 7-Eleven, call an ambulance. He went, yeah. You know, as if like no one's done that. I, I said, take a look around you. And he took the same look I had. And everyone in the bar was just staring like daggers at me, basically. Don't ask me what it means, Dodge. Yeah. I couldn't tell you if you yeah. paid me a million pounds, but they're staring at daggers at me. So, mate, go and, go and get cool. Bless him. He went out, I seen him go out to the club and he just looked at me and winked. And 10 minutes later, the ambulance people come in, right? Anyway, I went back to my chair. I'm, you know, I've done the right thing. I'm yeah. like, I saved this girl's life. This little beautiful Thai angel, yeah. you know, her parents in Chiang Mai are going to thank me, yeah, aren't they, yeah. you know? I didn't think anything. In the morning, I said, uh, Chris, do you want to come uh, breakfast with us? Y yeah, what? You what? I, I was so naive. Went to breakfast. I said to the boss, David, um, do I do I pay for it? You know, do, do you want... The little barman, Sam, leaned over and went, uh, you think the boss don't have money? Mm. Right? This is completely yeah. different culture and I'm... It up, dodge yeah. every, every single way. I'm trying to be a good guy yeah. and I'm screwing it up, you know. And then I noticed nobody were talking to me. In fact, because I understood quite a bit of Chinese by then or Cantonese, I could go, ah, guaylo, uh, guaylo, there's guaylo. And I'm like, they're talking about, Foreign you know, yeah, yeah. me. Even when I filled up someone's teacup before me, which is Chinese etiquette, they're like, oh, guaylo understands etiquette, you know, no, no. And I just turned to the boss and I said, uh, David, the, the, the Thai girl last night, he never he never would look at you. I mean, he couldn't look at you because his eyes were <laughs> looking all over the shop, but but he never looked at you he, he, and he never spoke unless he absolutely, unless you put him on the spot, he wouldn't speak. And, he's, and, I, and he, he nods. I said, uh, uh, I did the wrong thing, yeah? He, and he just nods, and I just knew, right, we're good now. Yeah. You know, he knows that that I'm trying to apologise. I, 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 and in case anyone's wondering, what I probably should have done is just grabbed the girl, legged it outside with her over my shoulder, and jumped in a cab and gone right hospital now. Mm. Right, safe face of the club, saved the girl. Right, you know, but they just wanted to chucked in the alleyway with a rubbish. Yeah. That that was this is a Hong Kong triad. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah, know, they, they do this, what they want not, to do. Yeah, you know, yeah. this is not you know. Brighton and Hove yeah. Albion or something. These are not good people. Yeah. They're all grown up on rough sink council estates or whatever the Hong Kong. And they're ruthless. Yeah. They what what's gone on in their family background, you don't even yeah. want to know, you know. So yeah, so that was that. And then um I was in the market one day buying a blanket. I'd I'd hooked up with this working girl. Uh, she was called Apple, she was a, a Filipina. Someone said, Chris, you got a new place. She's looking for a place. And I Dodge, I was lonely. You know, my girlfriend had left me in Hong Kong to go and join British Airways. She just hated Hong Kong, right? And deep down in my soul, I was like, you know, I, I hadn't made that spiritual connection yeah. yet. So I'm like in the flesh and blood. I need another person to make me yeah. whole, right? I'm a very different person now, right? And I meet this pretty little Filipina girl. She's a bar girl. She's doing all kinds of stuff for, for, for men, you yeah. know? And it was lovely, you know, it was nice to have company and she come in my place and I'm like, right, right, lie on my clothes. I'm going to go out and get you a blanket because there's nothing in this place, right? This, they pulled it down now. I went mm. back to Hong Kong in 2012 and I, I just really wanted to see that mm. building because I went mad in there, you know, mm. and, and they pulled it down. But when in the market, I bought this, looking at these blankets in an open shop front and I picked up the label and it said, Waste, huh? In it, like English, mm. in, written in red. Waste. In that moment, I knew these blankets were the blankets that the North American settlers and army gave to the Indians to like wipe them out. The ones with smallpox and tuberculosis, right? Dodge. I'm not saying that story's real. Yeah. I'm just saying in my mind, in mind at yeah. that time, yeah. that's it was so obvious to me. 
Were you? Did were you realise that you were going a bit nuts? No, of course not. You weren't. You no, were just no, feeling no. like these blankets are full of tobacco. And no, no, no. But I'm not saying that. I'm just saying as you're using more and getting more addicted, mm. and a lot of pain inside you. Were you getting to a point where you're going? You know, I'm becoming an addict here, and I'm actually doing my own editing. I knew I was an addict on that Chim Sa Choi platform mm. when I couldn't get home. I couldn't get home. I'm like, right, should I? Shouldn't? Yeah, fucking do it. And mm. I knew I was on a ride, Dodge, right? How long were you in total in Hong Kong for? Uh, about 14 months. Okay. And then when you left Hong Kong, where did you go? I went back to the UK. Yeah. But... What, I mean, other, what, other, what other situations did you get yourself into with the triads? So, uh, it was quite a lot, really. Did you ever get yourself into a lot of trouble with them? Yeah. What was the worst amount of trouble you got into? Well, the trouble I got into is they couldn't understand me because I'm off my head and I'm in psychosis, Dodge. I believe those blankets in the market were, and I, I started to think the world was some big conspiracy. Bit so you're like, getting para as well? Yeah, how did they clock that you were getting paranoid? Well, I I don't know, but they started to realise... Something's not right. You know, and I'm just doing my job. I'm off my head every night as a doorman. I'm, I'm going When you're off your head on crystal meth and it's pure speed, you're still super aware of everything going on, mm. just at a lot faster pace. Yeah, but only to a point. When you haven't slept for nine days, yeah. then you're entering yeah. hallucinations big time. Okay. Then the psychosis kicks in and you're hearing... A voice, voice in your noises. head. Yeah, it's okay. your voice, yeah. by the way. I've just had this in a podcast. Mm. It's your voice, but you've got your own voice going, you know, this is a cup of tea, let's have mm. a sugar. Then you've got a voice going, ah, cup of tea, cup of tea, cup of tea. Tea is this, tea means that. Mm. Sugar, da, da, and, and there's this big conspiracy mm. thing going on. Like I stared at cats for <laughs> seven <laughs> hours. <laughs> I thought there was puppets, Dodge. Mm. I stared at these cats <laughs> convinced the Asia's the heart of puppetry. Yeah. These cats, they're all on a string. Everything's connected. Hong Kong's like this big pinball machine. That car horn is connected to that sign swinging. Yeah. You know, I, I was really unwell. Yeah. Ended up trying to crawl across a wire between my building and the building opposite. Right? They were talking, what, 70 metres above the ground? Um, and I, well, I, So for, between the two buildings, there's one wire. Yeah. You're, but, you're going across... On yeah. your knees or... You no, doing a commando crawl that we were yeah, taught. Okay. And in my mind, that's why I joined the Marines was to learn a commando crawl. So you're crawling across on your belly yeah. with one leg dangling oh, down. okay, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And I, and I got to see the fat lady sing, which wasn't a fat... I mean, she may have been fat. Uh, but what it was, there was a silhouette in the building opposite in one of the rooms of this woman. And when, every time she brushed her hair, it looked like she's singing in a microphone. And she was a big old girl. And my mind saying... I got to go and see the fat. It's not over till I see the fat lady yeah. sing. Yeah. But also in my mind, it's like when I get there, I'm going to get, that's my enlightenment moment. I'm yeah. going to get all my answers in life. There's going to, all my friends are going to be over there. People that I've upset in the clubs, the triads are all going to, <laughs> we, we, we put you to the yeah. test, mate. And you, pat, you know, I got five meters out on that wire and I just thought, hang on, what are you doing? You didn't put this wire up here. Not like in the Marines where you know you test it's it. tested, yeah, 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 yeah. right? And then I started thinking about my brother back home and all the divorce and shit we had to go through as kids where he was my mate. We used to go to this school 300 miles away in the north, like this strange school. I had to fight the bullies and they wouldn't let me see my kid brother because he was in a junior's playground and I was in the adult, you know, the big kids' playground. So what we do is sit on the steps mm. just not to be lonely, Dodge, you know, not not – because it was fucking mad, you know. Mm. We didn't know what was going on and I could hold his hand and he's my little kid brother, you know. And I'm on this wire thinking, I ain't called him in a year. What am I doing? Yeah. What? Why am I on this? I don't have to fucking prove nothing to no one in this world. What am I doing? And, and that was like my first nervous breakdown. I just started crying uncontrollably and these tears, they're dropping like paratroopers from a Hercules into the darkness down on the people in the, who were like ants in the street below and they're all looking up going oh what's the crazy guilo doing today yeah you know because word got around everybody knew i was the crazy guilo i was mm. the crazy ghost man you know um 
with, to answer your question, in the club, one time I stood in the doorway. Uh, it was a stairs going up. The Hong Kong club is all about feng shui. So the mountain's going to be behind you, water in front. That's luck, right? Yep. Mirrored staircase has to reflect the evil spirits out. And they take this seriously. Seriously. They, do, yeah. seriously. Yeah. they believe in, like, you know, we believe in two magpies or whatever. Mm. They, they, and I'm there at the bottom of the stairwell and I was always new. Chinese business is Chinese business. Don't get involved, Chris. Mm. Just, you just sort out the Westerners, right? Uh, fight if you have to. In fact, the only fight I got into all the triads come to my defense. It was fucking brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was yeah. just like I felt I was such in the family, you yeah. know. But but this Daisu, did, 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 did they think you were a lunatic? I don't they, know did what they have a they bit know. of nerve to think. We've got a guy, Lou, here, English lunatic, who's losing the plot. I, I, yeah, but I did my job, mate, you know. I, but you, they must have thought something. To bring they, you into the family, whether you're Chinese, Italian, East London, Mancunian, yeah. to bring people into your family, you've got to like okay, them so and trust them. You must the, have done something. No, to, no. The family thing comes from Confucius, okay? Chinese culture. Confucius say, boss look after employee, in turn, employee res respect boss. Mm. Father, look after child. In return, child, respect father. Mm. Right, it's just Confuciusness. Nothing to do with triad connection. I was never a triad. It's just family Look, you know. I was in, the boss asked, the boss gi give me 500 quid on the first night when he heard I had no, nothing in my flat. Yeah, okay. Right? So Daisu, this six foot seven assassin, he comes charging out the club and he's got this guy over his shoulder, this seedy, like, ratty looking guy in mm. a, like a crappy suit, you know. Chu Chai, the other, the street fighter doorman, he's looking up the steps. He hasn't seen. I've seen. I spread eagle myself against the wall because, like, I can't get involved. This is Chinese business, right? Daisu comes. He throws this guy down, uh, like, with this animal, like, hey. Chu Chai turns, right, sees, and even without, like, they don't even have to speak. They just turn around and they start kicking this guy in the head as hard and as fast as they could, like like Millwall hooligans catching the you know the other the other supporters out the sight of the CT mm. cameras. Mm. Right, they are just doing this guy in, and I, I, I was I bothered. No, of course I wasn't, because I was like sociopathic myself at that yeah. time. You know, I'm just stood there going, okay, he's fucked up. You know, these are my guys, mm. and in a moment of clarity, that guy just burst between them, ran out of the club, and as they chased him, screaming, screaming, don't know if I can say, I, can't, I guess I can say it in Chinese, Jule Lam Mo, means do something to your mother, yeah. right? Right? What is it? Jule Lam Do Sup Bat Do? Jule Lam Mo. Sup Bat Do or something like oh, that. Oh, that's probably something else again. God yeah, nice. yeah. But basically, this bit of paper fluttered from his pocket and it landed on a step and they hadn't seen it. So I picked it up, shoved it in my pocket when no one was looking, I looked at it. It was a list of horses. So he'd been in the club flogging the names of hooky horses, mm. you know, because Hong Kong's a big yeah, race massive, circuit, massive right? Race yeah. Circuit, yeah. And these are the ones, if you bet on me, they used to do that. The triers would come in and go, all right, guys, you give me a bit of paper and had a horse name on it. <laughs> it's like, put your money on Dude, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or they come in and they they give me like 40 mile, bro. Knocked off from the mark, you know, mm -hmm. smuggled in from China or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah, I felt like I belonged on, yeah. you know. What made you leave Hong Kong to come back to England if you felt like you'd been belong? You've been um, I, I lost the plot too bad. Okay, I got so utterly delusional. I went out one day to try and throw myself off one of the cranes in the Hong Kong harbour, not to kill myself, but to prove I was in control. So off a crane into yeah. Hong Kong Harbour. Yeah, into these, water the, there. these cranes are like 40, yeah. meter, 40 metres high. Yeah. Right? And did that was you, my did you intention. Climb up? No, I never got that no, far because okay. I was too mental. I couldn't get anything together, mate. Yeah. The, the, the but best. That was going through your head. The best I got was managed to buy batteries for me boogie box, which I took because mm. it was important. I had an Anthony Robbins, you know, <laughs> Awaken the Giant yeah. Within book. Yeah. Right? Right? <laughs> yeah. And I'm wondering. And I come across this courtyard and two little lads were playing football in a goal. And I just went in, I put the stuff down and I played football with them. And there was nothing needed to be said, mate. Mm. I wasn't meant, you know, I mean, I was clearly mental, but I just played football with these little boys, you know, and it was fucking brilliant. Mm. And then I went back out into chaos. Um, 
there's a lot of stuff going on on in, in, in my head. I've got all my last bits of money, everything, right? I've got nothing left after this bundle of cash. And I shoved it in a charity box in this garage, petrol garage. You know, I'm like, there you go. Look, that's me. You know, if you want to hate me because I've given all my last money to charity, keep fucking hating me. You, oh. you, because you get a lot of flat when you live that life. And then some of it's imagined and some of it's real. Yeah. And eventually I uh, made a phone call to my old man. I'm like, oh, dad. They was like beside themselves. They got these, you know, I never phoned them for a year. What year they, are we talking here? Uh, this is 90, 96 now. 96, okay. Yeah. Suddenly I'm, 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 I'm getting, I'm speaking to my dad on the phone. He's going, son, be careful of the washing machine. I'm like, does my dad think I'm being brain? I'm like, dad, no, it's all right. Yeah, but son, you know, keep your passport, son, keep your pass. They thought I'd been abducted by a cult because they couldn't understand these confused messages that I was trying to say. Finally, I was staying with a mate, a uh, lovely guy called Sam, and he, he you know, he loved me. He was just like, Chris, yeah, come come stay, because I was homeless again, you know, and no job. Da -da 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 -da. And, and, and eventually, uh, one night, it was all just too much. I was just totally paranoid, totally couldn't even, I had to get off the bus because, like, every, all the Chinese chatter, I was trying to interpret it, and it was interpreted, the Guaylo does this, uh, the Guaylo, he's doing that. Yeah, the Guaylo, he hasn't got a job. Yeah, the Guaylo, he's, you know, not having a job in Hong Kong is a big, bad thing. So you were right, getting right? paranoid that they were saying that? Oh, yeah, I, I totally oh, believed yeah. totally believed it, you know. I, I, so I, what made you come home? What was the point well, you go, I've got to get out of here. I'm a young lad from Plymouth. <laughs> Yeah, but I don't know like, all that, do I? No, I'm, I know that, I'm, but I'm me looking moment, in, I'm yeah. thinking, young lad from Plymouth, got in the jumped out to Hong Kong, got in with the naughty people out there. They've warmed to you, obviously, and loads of nuttiness is going on, which yeah. you all haven't got a clue about. So I called my old man. I said, Dad, it's, it's all gone a bit wrong here, I'm afraid. He said, yes, yeah, son, we, we, we worked that out. <laughs> he said, why don't you come home? I was like, no, I can't go. I can't. What have I got in the UK? Hong Kong's where oh, I'm going out 24 7. Mm. I'm dancing with the Filipina girls. They, they all love me. I'm a door. No, I'm not, am I? I'm not. And now I'm becoming a bit of a la. <sighs> yeah, Dad, you could be right. He says, Son, just get you back on your feet. That's all. Mm. Like, yeah, I could come back, get back on my feet, put all my uh, bodybuilding weight back mm. on, and uh, come back out. He says, Son, I'll call you back in 20 minutes, all right? I was like, All right, Dad. Phone rings. All right, Dad. So I booked you a flight on Virgin Atlantic tomorrow night, five o'clock. All right. Yeah, thanks, Dad. And in that moment, Dodge, the, the, game changer. I, I spent the night. Yeah. I went to say goodbye to everyone in the clubs. It, you know, it, it was still guys I'm in touch with today, funnily enough, you know. Mm. Got to the airport five o'clock, didn't I, with Sam. And um, his best buddy, they were they, 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 both two Chinese guys, you know, best buddies of mine. They, they took me to the airport. I got there for five o'clock, didn't I? I'm forgetting you got to check in two hours early. <laughs> the woman on the checker, she's like, ah, oh, sorry, uh, cannot go. Flight flight gone already. I'm like, what? It can't be gone. My dad's like, bought, bought, bought a ticket. Uh, wait, one moment. And she makes this phone call. She's, you are very lucky. Flight is still on a tarmac, you, but you must hurry, right? She calls up this customs guy. He comes, he grabs all my stinking, like, luggage, because that, that's just read my book if you yeah. want to know why, folk, right? And we're running through customs. He takes me in his office. He's like, um, I need to ask you, uh, do you have anything on your person you shouldn't do, right? <laughs> I didn't tell him about this packet of crystal meth. I got tucked <laughs> into the lining of my boot, right? <laughs> I'm like, no, of course not. Okay, let's go. And he ran me out. to. He, uh, we got on a bus for the first time in a, a year and two months in Hong Kong. I had a bus all to myself, right? <laughs> and it drove me out to this this uh, virgin flight, right? The poor stewardesses were waiting patiently at the top of the stairs, you know, to greet me. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm, I'm, I've made your day, haven't <laughs> I, you know? And I went up the stairs and I just took one last look over Hong Kong and I just thought, 
I just thought of everything. I thought of the triads. I thought about the people I've fallen out with. I thought the job, my best job over there, were like off my head. I was teaching kids, right? It, it, uh, and, and they fucking love me, Dodge, mm, right? I bet. They fucking, I just play games with them. One day we snuck out of the classroom. I'm like, guys, should we, should we go on an adventure? Right, get down, get down. Mm. Right, so we all snuck down. We crawled under the windows of all the other classrooms, <laughs> right? And all the kids are turning around to each other, going shh, shh, shh. <laughs> right? And we went and played outside. Yeah. It was like all totally <laughs> like against Chinese culture. But um, I lost that. I, 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 I got so many. It was just before I went for that walk, that crazy walk, and and, and I rocked up in the playground. And tell me where. Tell me what happened when you got back to England. What was your route okay? Been? And what's your route been for the last thirty years? We've done the right. We've done the the Hong Kong. What's yeah. your route been? I see so that you're Mar doing lots of what you got on there, Marathon de Sabla. Yeah. Tell me all the adventures you've gone. Tell me all the countries you've been to. Okay, so I'm currently English Veteran of the Year. Yep. For inspiration. Okay, it's well been done. a bit of a long journey. It's nothing to do with military or, yep. you know, killing people. It's about what you give to society. Yep. Um, and it's, yeah, it's been a, it's been a journey, Dodge. So I traveled the whole world. How old are you today? I'm 27. <laughs> Is that, do you believe me? You don't, do you? <laughs> All right, I'm 53. 53, okay. Yeah, I'm 53. Um, I live now as what I, you'd call an enlightened individual. You know, I'm, I'm, I've a, a achieved a different state of consciousness from all this nonsense that I'm telling you yeah. about. And it's a beautiful place to be. Yeah. Um, only do love. Um, don't do hate. Don't do conflict. Don't do military. Sorry, but all that is just utter. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's a distraction, Dodge, yeah. you know, from finding out who we who you are. actually yeah. are. You I hear know? You. So I've lived, worked, and traveled 85 countries across all seven continents, qualified pilot, skydiver, Antarctic scuba diver, been to the Antarctic Polar Circle. I've run the length for the United Kingdom, ultra marathon a day, every day, 36 days. Hold on, hold on, Jesus. You've run the length of the UK? Yeah. How long did that take? Uh, 36 days, carrying 15 kilogram backpack with all my camping gear in. Although I did jettison some of it as I went on. So, so how do you run the length of the country? You get a flight to John O'Groats, yep. a place called Wick. Yeah. You've got to get a taxi the last 20 miles. You look at your compass. If it points south, you're good to go. So, you, so you're up there and you go, right, I'm going south. Yeah. And exactly. you keep running and yep. keep running. No training whatsoever. I've been disabled for two years. I, I've been waiting for a back operation. So I've been in bed for a year and a half of that. Uh, didn't do any training whatsoever. Not even, I think I'm, I ran like three mile around the block just to check my legs still work. And I thought, right, now's my time. Let's go and, wow. let's go and do it. What year was that? That was 2018, I think. I was yeah. raised awareness of the veteran suicide issue, which is, you know, it, you know, we're losing a lot of yeah. people that we shouldn't be because yeah. of all the identity, you know, the unresolved trauma dodge, you know, all the stuff yeah. that I'm good at now. So if anyone's listening and you're suffering, just get in contact with me and we, we'll get it sorted because it's a beautiful and life. And anyone you know? who's listening, there's a website out there called Jack, J-A-A-Q dot org. If anyone's got any mental health issues or needs to ask a question, go on to Jack dot org. It is unbelievable. Yeah. It's like the masterclass of everything you need to know about mm. presented in a really user friendly way. Really? And what else, what else are you doing? Say so scuba diver, jumping out of planes. Yeah. Oh, if, where do you want to start? You know, give I've me been jumping out of planes, skydiving. Sky right. Diving. So I, I first jumped in the military. Yep. Did the military parachute course. Actually, did two of them because um, the first one got cancelled after the balloon jump because of the first Gulf War. All the Hercules were going out to the Gulf. Um, I'm in that balloon, and they're really strict. They're like, right, when you're in the balloon, fellas, it's one thousand, two thousand, three thousand. Check canopy. We don't want to hear anything else, all right? So I got up there. He went, he said, right, who wants to be first? Well, I was with three, what what we call baby paras, not being patronizing mm. to our beautiful para brothers, mm. but that's what they refer to when they're young paras, right? I'm, I'm a Royal Marine, trained Royal Marine with three baby paras, so yeah. who's going to go out first? Mm. It's got to be mm. me, right? I said, that'll be me. I went, okay, to the door. They clip you on, right? In the door. Go. I'm like, 
Geronimo! <laughs> <laughs> when I got on the ground, the, the jump instructor wasn't too impressed, but I think I think secretly he was. Um, so that 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 was great, and you end up jumping at night. It's just incredible, you know. Mm. Jumping at nights is pretty safe so long as you land on a Gurkha. That's you know, just <laughs> yeah, that's a joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bless them. Now we did we had a lot of Gurkhas on mm. our, our, our course, and they were they was incredible. Do you think like I'm listening to this story and. You're 53 years old. You've obviously had something happen in your junior years, which you spoke about, which you don't want to go into too much detail. Mm. Do you feel like you're running away from anything? Well, I probably was a lot of my life. Mm. I, I don't know if you call it running away or running into. Um, when I got to 48, I'd done all the raving thing, the dance era. Got, a, I'd say, a lot of answers there, you know, or a lot of learning dodge, you mm. know. I learned that you could be crashed on the floor of a rave or in a warehouse with this guy's a refuse collector, this guy's a solicitor. And everyone loves each other. And you're all sharing a doobie. Yeah, yeah. And it just all that shit that your parents taught you about class system and all that nonsense yeah. is, you know, so I started to raise my consciousness mm. then. When I got to about 48, I started to do a bit of gardening. <laughs> just bit of garden conversion you can say because we lived on a hill and I started to listen to a few YouTube channels mm. that just come into my life at that time for various reasons and I started to get awareness of like that we have levels of consciousness yeah. and I'd never known that before I'd have thought life's life and yeah. you know drink a beer, drink yeah. a beer, drink yeah. a beer <laughs> blah, blah. and and off the back of that it's topped off my learning journey, you know, it's been the, the, the piece de la resistance, the, the cherry on a cake. Yeah. Um, I've subsequently learned how to change my diet, change my thinking, yeah. change my exercise. Powerful. Change your mindset. Which ultimately changes your mind. Yeah. And if you think about Nikola Tesla, who said life is energy, frequency and vibration mm. so if you want to change your life mm. where does it start well it starts with your thoughts because you have a um, thought pattern complex yeah. so what what you think is how you're gonna be yeah. what you are is what you put out in the world your words right? are your wand yeah exactly That's my mum was so saying when i'm out the front door i'm saying hello to everybody yeah why because that person could be going home to commit suicide yeah, that person might have just lost their son yeah that person might just feel like a loser because that's what the the psychopathic elite want you to feel like, yeah. you know, and, and they've, let's be honest, they've done a really good job, mm. you know, they've damaged society so much. I think Pe so. People yeah. don't even say hello anymore. Yeah. And it's, it's I just- I think the press, yeah. I think social media is damaging society very quickly. Spot on, mate, yeah. spot on, you know. Um, you seem very awake, mate, you seem very at peace. Yeah, it's a beautiful life, yeah. Dodge, you know, yeah. but it's only about love. Yeah. And did you ever think you'd have a Royal Marines commando who've been in conflict, combat, seen some horrible mm. things in my life, that I'll be saying it's all about love, folks. Yeah. And if you haven't got it yet, you've got some work to do. You've got some work to do. You've got some work to do. You don't have to do it because you don't have to live my life. Yeah. You've got to live your life. But if you're unhappy, if you're getting up for the grind and you're thinking, oh, is this, I'd do the work Yeah. because I live in paradise. Yeah. I wake up every day in paradise mm. doesn't matter what struggles or you know you get challenges life is challenging yeah. we we live in this three-dimensional physical self but i transcend that by living on a higher level yeah. called what's known as fifth dimension yeah right so quantum. this is just a, a an avatar but that's the quantum level yes right? exactly exactly but not a lot of people know about it yeah this and is why and also the inner peace inner peace of your own mind is the most powerful thing mm. anyone can have so you've been there, Dodge, yeah, you know, so you get it. Yeah, you mate. get it and it's beautiful. And I recently spent a weekend, I went away on a, let's just call it a spiritual weekend. It's not the sort of thing I thought I'd ever go on. And one of my um, viewers on YouTube phoned me up and said, Chris, look, you know, I like what you do. I think we can help veterans here. Will you come away for me for the weekend to Glastonbury, right? Not not the Glastonbury. We went a Straight week late. got the crystal meth from the <laughs> yeah, yeah. and the weed. <laughs> You're like, I'm in, yeah, I'm yeah. in. 
but we went a week, <laughs> a week later and we rocked up at this campsite and I just met these two beautiful people. Yeah. And I said, fellas, you know, I'm 53. This is the first time in my life I've spent with spiritually enlightened people. Yeah, it's powerful, you isn't know? it? And we don't, you, I don't have to tell you anything about me, do I? And they're mm. like, no, you don't, Chris. We mm. know who you are. We know, yeah. we know where you are. We know where, because we, we've all been through childhood trauma, don't yeah. you know? We're, and and that was it. And it mm. was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was great. Mm. Chris, I've really, really enjoyed this episode. You're a special person, mate. We're all special people, yeah. mate. Chris, let's end it on that note. Mate, amazing. <laughs> mate, amazing. Honestly, I really enjoyed that. Really enjoyed that. And just before we finish off here, where can people find you? So Chris Thrall, all over Google, YouTube, whatever, at Chris Thrall on social media. The only difference is LinkedIn. I'm Chris Dot Thrall. Yeah. If you're struggling, folks, hit me up for a free 15-minute chat. We'll see if we can, you know, get some work done because life's too short not to be happy, okay. you know. Um, you want to buy my books, they're all on Amazon. I suggest you do because, again, like I'm not going to write a shit book, Dodge. Yeah. It's got to be a, a... I've heard really good things. Anyone yeah, out there, yeah. go and have a look yeah, at Chris because yeah. he's doing some good stuff. You'll find me if you want to find <laughs> me. But on YouTube, you know, we've got a great channel. Uh, we do our best. We... we we tell the truth and we got to be a bit careful because we're all a bit kind of governed there, aren't we? You know, mm. but we got a locals channel where we just uh, let it all hang out. Well, so <laughs> you, uh, you're a good man. You take care of yourself, Chris. You too, brother. Nice one, mate. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>